And we, we kind of forget that like you can have a positive influence on others too. And we, even though we are such a food centric society where it's like, Hey, let's get together. We're going to go out for drinks. We're going to go enjoy this new restaurant. You can still have those things, but twist it a little. Like you said, let's, we're going to go to a slightly different, different restaurant, or we're going, you're going to look up the macros and things before and make sure it can fit in your day. Hey guys, it's Corey from Redefining Strength. Welcome to the Fitness Hacks Podcast. So today I want to talk about creating new habits. It's freaking hard to create those new habits. And when we finally feel like we actually have something new ingrained, we have that new behavior, we feel like, oh, this is perfect. You know, it's going to last forever. Life does something that throws us a curveball and all of a sudden an old habit, an old pattern rears its ugly head. That's why in this episode, I really want to break down how to break those old patterns, how to create lasting changes. And Michelle is going to share some great tips to really help us create those behaviors that stick. So let's jump right in. So I want to talk about a few components of my strong systems. I want to talk about things that I think are very important to creating actual success towards a goal because for the longest time I rebelled against goal setting because I thought it was sort of silly. You know, I'm like, oh, I don't need to set goals, but we need to have that direction if we want to succeed. However, when we set goals so often, we don't create anything that actually leads to action. We don't create those systems. We set the dream, the wish, the hope, but not how we're actually going to get there. So that's why I started creating the strong systems. And a very important component of this is not only having the vision for where you want to go, but understanding where you're at currently. If we don't understand our current lifestyle, our current situation, our current mindsets, we can't create habits that meet us where we're at to actually drive us forward. Like if you think about how you go about approaching getting to a destination, right? You enter the destination and your current location into that GPS. And I even love that the GPS finds exactly where we are, right? Because in order to map out the route, we need to know where we're starting from. So when you're looking at making habit changes, you need to truly assess who I am, what I need in this moment, right? Because the more you can meet yourself where you're at, the more you're going to create things that actually become behaviors that you can repeat successfully again and again and again. So if you're thinking, well, you know, I want to do six days a week, but realistically your schedule allows for three, trying to force six days as much as it might seem like it's a really good way to reach your goals won't work. Doing three days might work a lot better, even if you think, well, if this isn't the ideal, I could get more out of this, right? But that's going to meet you where you're at. It's going to move you forward. It's going to see those results snowball. And then you can always add on more. So often we don't think we have the discipline to do something because we're relying on self-control, we're relying on willpower because we're trying to implement something that doesn't truly meet us where we're at. And then in meeting yourself where you're at, in owning your current situation and knowing that beast stat or beast origin story, as I like to call it, and I call it that because we're all our own heroes and sort of owning the hard that we have, the pain of staying stuck really helps us embrace changes that might seem a little difficult. But in making changes, we also have to optimize for the challenges that we've seen in the past or the struggles that we've seen in the past. Because the more we can really recognize what we've struggled with, what has created hiccups and setbacks before, the more we can plan around that. And that's actually the O in the strong systems. And I think this is such an important part, like part of it, because so often we think, oh, well, I don't want to think of the negative, right? We run from our failures, we run from our setbacks, and ultimately we then repeat them. We just do them in a way that's sort of been prepackaged in a different program in a different way. We don't even recognize that it's the same thing just being repeated over and over again, keeping us stuck in the cycle. So as much as you're not only assessing your current situation, I want you to be assessing what have I truly struggled with in the past and why? What have been hard habits to break, you know, or what have been hard patterns to break? Why have they been so hard? Because the more we own that, the more we can really make sure that we're creating changes that not only meet us where we're at, but that optimize to help us move past the hard things we've encountered, overcome those challenges. And even recognizing that, hey, something's going to pop up we can't rec- uh, we've never handled before, we've never known before. What can I do to then help myself move forward as fast as possible when I do have those hiccups and setbacks? Knowing that we're going to at points to fall back into old patterns. But the more we sort of plan for it, the more we recognize old patterns and own them, the more we can really create that successful plan to help us move forward no matter what. So... Now, I'm super excited to uh, jump in with Michelle to how to change those behaviors, because I think the more we really learn about ourselves and build that self-awareness, the more we can truly be successful at reaching any goals we set. I'm super excited to actually be joined by Michelle in person to talk about tips to help behaviors stick. 
So welcome, Michelle. Hi, and thanks for having me. So let's just jump right into tip number one. If we're trying to change those behaviors, get new things to stick, how can we go about the changes? Scale back the size first and foremost. So many times I hear people going all or like all in or nothing. So it's very much like, oh, I know I need to eat healthier. So I'm just not going to eat dessert. I'm not going to eat sugar. And the problem with this mentality is, first of all, it's really not sustainable. Another issue is like we want to build those small, take those small steps so that we can actually achieve our big goal over time. So really making sure that you're taking things back a little bit and actually doing something that you can kind of ease into and create that habit. So the easier you can create a habit and kind of set that goal and actually achieve it, you're going to be like, okay, I can stick to this. It's making it bite-sized enough that it's manageable so that you can move forward and build that momentum. Because I think so often when we say like the big thing we want to change, it's not actually an action item either. And that's kind of part of the problem. Yeah. And that goes right into the other tip is you have to be specific. You can't just say, I'm going to eat healthier. Like I'm starting tomorrow. I'm going to eat healthier. How? How are you going to do that? And really, again, goes back to small goals. So setting it up that like I'm going to hit a high protein breakfast with 20 or 30 grams of breakfast in the morning or even making like a a goal of I'm going to eat five servings of veggies today. Start having something that you know that you can actually hit. Again, making sure it's appropriate, something that is going to be doable, challenge you, but doable and be specific. Make sure you're giving it a number. Make sure you are kind of tracking and being able to check those boxes off if you um, are actually able to achieve it. I love that you brought up like how, because I think often we say like what we want to achieve. We even know why we want to achieve it, but we don't know how we're actually going to implement the change. And so it's even like, I want to be more consistent or I want to track macros. Okay, well, how are you going to track macros? What variation of it are you going to take? What are you going to sh- try and shoot for? Like if something goes wrong, how are you even going to plan for it? So the more you can pick one of those little things, the more too, by making that small change, you feel successful. You want to do more. Things continue to snowball. Yeah. And I think like everyone wants to jump from the start line to the finish line. And it's really those small steps, those small progressions. And we don't want to hear about how hard it was. We just want to say like, well, what did it take to get you here? And people want to know what they're doing there and now. But truthfully, it wasn't there and now that's actually got them where they where they are. It's all the little things that have led up to it over the time. And we do think it's all about like willpower, motivation, self-control. But the reason we feel it has to be about those things or we don't have enough of those things is because we are taking that all or nothing approach versus the small changes that really do build the momentum. Because when you're forcing so much, like you're having to think about it all the time versus if you do one change and then it becomes natural, then you can do another change off of that. And you don't even realize you've built two changes on top of each other. You've just now made two changes because one was so easy to implement. Yeah, exactly really making that snowball effect count and building up towards it. So we're not going all or nothing. We're making that one very specific focus when we want to make the habit changes. How else can we make behavior stick? Just making it easier. So actually thinking about your environment that you're around and what can you actually do that's going to make it easier for you to choose those behaviors that you're wanting to implement more of. So looking at the environment and re-engineering it if you need to. So this is can be just as simple as open up your fridge right now, look into it. What what do you see first? And is the first thing that you're seeing something that you should be eating more of and having lots in your diet? Or is it something that maybe you shouldn't be consuming as much? And if it's the latter, let's reorganize that fridge. Let's put the put the things that we want more in our diet at the forefront. So when you're opening it, that's going to be something that you see and making it easier on yourself. Can you open your fridge right now and grab like an easy 10 grams, 15 grams, 20 grams of protein without even really having to think very hard? And if the answer is no, you probably need more snacks that are going to be easily available to you and more protein options to even add to your day. So, and the same thing can be said with your cupboard. So really just making sure that the food that you should be eating are is actually available to you and don't think about the ideal day where you can come home and cook, but think about the lazy day. Legitimately, can you add and create a meal that has 30 grams of protein in under 15 minutes or have a snack that has 10 grams of protein in under five? Because that's going to be most likely what most of us are going to do. So you want to be realistic with that. It's almost planning for it to be so easy that you can replicate it no matter what. So 
if when you're thinking about making changes and creating that environment, it's like, how can you foolproof it or baby proof it for yourself? Like, how can you have the foods readily available? Like, I even like when I've, you know, made an ice cream pie over the weekend on a day I want to enjoy it, where I know there's leftover candy, I freeze the candy. I know the candy in the cupboard is not going to go bad for a very long time, but I also know that seeing it there is going to make more tempting. So I put it in the freezer for some reason. That instantly is like, oh, I'll be here for whenever. I can make another ice cream pie later. It's just a little change to my environment, but it helps me mentally make that switch and stay consistent. So it might be something as simple as that, but it's finding ways that we can sort of address our inner weirdness and find our balance, but that doesn't trigger us to have to have self-control when we might not actually have it at the end of a long day. We're trying to make that habit change that might be something that's almost an innate pattern to us. I really like that because I totally do that too, where I freeze candy and and purposely don't even put it in the the fridge in the kitchen, I put it in the outdoor fridge. So even taking that into consideration, like we're late, we're humans are naturally lazy. We don't like to take the extra time. We don't like to take the extra steps. So even if you can make things a little bit more difficult to get to, you may find yourself slowing down so that again, the habits that we want at the forefront are easier to do than potentially eating those foods that we know we are supposed to be the sometimes foods. It's any way you can make Unha- uh, unconscious patterns more conscious because they are like when you're emotional, right? And you go eat, you think, why can't I break this pattern? But it's a pattern that solved a problem for you in the past. And so you keep repeating it. And almost before you're even aware of it, sometimes you've repeated it. So the more you can make yourself conscious of it through these other triggers, the better off you're going to be. And like I've even found with like Rice Krispie treats, I love them. If I have a whole pan, I will eat the whole pan that's there. But by getting the individually wrapped ones, instantly I only eat one. Sometimes I'll have two, you know, work it in, whatever. But the fact that I have to open one is there's like a conscious decision to it. So it makes it harder to go back for that second versus a food that would be a trigger for food for me otherwise no longer is. So it's finding that little like balance so that you can have those patterns be broken or at least interrupted momentarily. So you can Mm -hmm. assess, do I actually want to do this? Yeah. And and that's such an important thing is the interruption, like the slowing down process to actually think before you eat. Um, because so many of us just do things automatically. So yeah, definitely make sure that we are taking into consideration our own environment. And even if you know you overconsume those foods, make those foods a little bit more difficult to reach. So this is putting things on top shelves. This is, like you said, freezing items. Really take, take a look at your diet habit currently and see what needs to be adjusted. Even if you kind of overcorrect for a little bit and you say, hey, I'm not buying this because I don't think right now like I can handle that or I don't think I can break the pattern if it's right there. Sometimes even if you do that, even if you have an exit strategy to eventually have it or include it, just that little break in your routine, break in your pattern could be enough to help you overcome that hurdle and make those behaviors really stick. So then you can go back to even including some of the things you love, but in a new way. Yeah. And that's important is the mindset if you are going to remove something because you feel like you need to kind of readjust, remove it, but with that plan and with the knowledge that you are going to add it in because we don't want to get in that restrict binge cycle. So really having that understanding that you're going to have it again. It's making it a choice versus something you have to do. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we're trying to change the behaviors. We know we're not going all or nothing. We're making this small, specific tweak that meets us where we're at. We are like changing our environment. What else can we do to really make sure that those new behaviors stick? So we've talked about this before, but habit stack. If you have something you already do daily, make it or add another habit to it, the new habit to it. So for example, if you are trying to increase your water intake and you have a morning ritual where you have coffee, have your coffee, have it with a cup of water too. So it can be very simple. Just this is going to be my trigger for adding this habit. And I think the hardest thing is, is if you're just going at it cold, where like, I have this new habit, this is going to be my new habit. Okay, great. What's going to be your your reminder to do that? And I know some people will even put things in their phone to have alarms go off, which is great. That works too. But if it's, if you can tie it with something that you're already going to do, it makes it a little bit easier. And we do have to to kind of take into consideration the mental capacity because every time you add a new habit, it does, it has an addition to your mental load. And so we want to make sure that we are doing things as easy as we can for us. I like that you brought up the mental side of things too, because I even think attaching a new habit, which you might be hesitant to do, or you might not necessarily like as much to something you actually do like, can shift your perspective of it. So if you, let's say, don't necessarily enjoy drinking water, which 
don't know if anybody will say, I don't enjoy doing it. I just don't remember to do it. But if you attach it to a habit you actually like, you'll have a more positive association with it. And I bring this up specifically with tracking. So if you're like hesitant to track, you don't want to plan ahead, maybe even tying that to another behavior you do like, maybe you like looking for new recipes. So you actually tie that in where I'm looking for new recipes and at this time of planning out days ahead, you're associating a behavior you might be hesitant to do that you might not do otherwise with something you actually enjoy. And I feel like that positive association can sometimes help us really implement it as well. Yeah, that actually goes right into my next tip, which is temptation bundle. Combine your want with what you with a should. So making sure that, like you just said, if you want to do something and you want to kind of make sure that you're creating that habit around it, you're going to add that need or that should that you are, are going to kind of implement as well. So exactly what you said is really just making making it a positive experience by adding it to something that you want to be doing. So I know like even for, we'll, we'll do an exercise example on this one. So if you like talking on the phone and you're trying to get more steps in, your thing can be, I'm going to call my friend, I'm going to call my family member, but I'm going to be moving during this time. So I'm going to go for a walk while I do these things. So that's kind of just important to kind of keep in mind too. I think habit stacking is great, but also doing that temptation bundle where you know you have things that you want to do. So another example, we'll do a food example this time. But if you are working on trying to increase your fiber intake and you know you need to be eating more fruits and vegetables and you really like that TV show that you've been kind of binging on, have the habit of where you're going to like, I want to watch this. I'm going to have a fiber filled snack while I watch this. So just simply adding some carrots to that, to that TV binging episode that you have, it can be a great way to kind of get in some needed nutrition and added fiber. I love that you have that healthy snack and you get to enjoy the show. It's, it is really funny how much that mindset though does come into play where you're changing your perspective of something by association with something that you already enjoy. And I think so often we don't do that. Instead, what happens is we go on a diet And we're like, oh, I can't go out with friends now. And so saying, oh, well, hey, I have to eat these healthy meals. How could I actually invite my friends to come to this healthy restaurant with me? Or how can I invite my friends over for a dinner where I'm controlling the macros to hit my macros? And so then you're not only bringing in the thing that you feel like you would miss, but you're still getting to do something that you feel like you need for yourself. So you're creating that positive association. You're showing yourself it doesn't have to be restriction. You're changing your perspective of it by how you're implementing it. And I think a lot of times we just think, oh, I have this thing, now I have to do this, and I can't do this, over how can I work both together to make both kind of more fun, but also make sure I'm sustaining my lifestyle with the new changes, embracing the new identity. And I really like that example because I think so often we get lost in like, okay, well, I'm so worried to do this outside of my home. And we we kind of forget that like you can have a positive influence on others too. And we even though we are such a food centric society where it's like, hey, let's get together. We're going to go out for drinks. We're going to go enjoy this new restaurant. You can still have those things, but twist it a little. Like you said, let's we're going to go to a slightly different different restaurant, or we're going you're going to look up the macros and things before and make sure it can fit in your day. So it's really doing that give and take, um, even when it comes to kind of creating these sustainable habits as well. But it is, it's making them fun and making them, you, making yourself see how you can include them as part of your lifestyle too. I think that's something we forget is that like, it, we fake it till we make it versus acting as if, right? And I know it seems like such a weird delineation, but I think it's because we're forcing ourselves into these habits that don't actually feel like they'll be part of our lifestyle versus saying, how can these habits be a part of my lifestyle? Hey, I like going out to a restaurant. How can I work in either a new restaurant or find something at that place? Or, hey, I like having friends over and entertaining. Okay, well, can I find macro-friendly recipes that I might be able to make with my friends? How can I make these healthy changes a true part of my lifestyle versus forcing them onto myself to get a result, ultimately, that I won't actually sustain the habits because I'm kind of faking this lifestyle that I want to build? Yeah, it's that white knuckle approach. Like, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to do it all. But at the end, that approach is just not going to be sustainable because at some point you're going to get tired of doing it because it is going to be that extra mental load. It is going to be that, um, I like, I, I can't do it unless it's perfect versus I'm going to take this slow. I'm going to add one thing at a time until it becomes a habit. And then I know I can continue and have this snowball effect and get to where I want to go faster. And that's the big thing is, is I always have people that they want the fast route and yeah, we can do the fast route, but the issue hasn't been getting you there. It's been staying there. And that usually the slower route actually is the faster route 
at the end of the day. No, it's true. Because when you try and go fast, again, you're putting all these habits on yourself, which you're going to fake and do, but you're not actually ingraining them as true lifestyle changes. You're not embracing that you're going to have to evolve with it and enforcing those things. They don't stick. You throw spaghetti at the wall. Something might stick a little bit, but you don't know what or how or if enough is going to stick to really see results. Well, I don't know what results you would want spaghetti <laughs> stuck on the wall for, but it, it isn't something that's truly a, a true change that you're embracing. And if you want those true changes... It might feel slow, but it ultimately is faster because you're not going to have to keep going on that wheel. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Those are such helpful tips to help us really make those behavior changes that we need. Thanks for having me. So I want to share some nutritional tips to help you really dial in those nutritional habits because I think often we think adjusting our diet is the hardest part. I know I've said that. I've heard that said a lot by other clients as well. Sometimes making those dietary adjustments just doesn't feel easy. And I think it's because of how we approach it. We say, I want to be more consistent. I want to track my food. I want to eat more vegetables. We say what we want to do, but we don't truly give ourselves how we're going to accomplish this. And in not giving the how, we don't set ourselves up for success because we're not breaking it down into manageable habits. That's why I want to talk about if like tips to help you be more consistent if you've ever thought, I can't get consistent with my eating. Okay, So five habits to help you stay on track. Number one, if you thought like, oh, I'm just not consistent with tracking. Tracking is really a struggle. I can't track. In terms of this, yes, it is a big habit change to make. But when we're going about making a habit change, how can we break it down? That's what we always want to think. How can I make this more manageable pieces? So it might be how you track. Maybe you don't use an app on your phone. Maybe you just write it down on a piece of paper to start because that's easier. Instead of doing a food scale to weigh, maybe use hand portion guides to start to really understand your portions, right? There's ways to break it down. Even planning ahead is one of my favorite things. I can tell you, even after like a decade of tracking macros, I am not necessarily good in the day of like eating what I want to eat going along the day. And then at the end of the day, making sure that I've hit everything perfectly. I end up having something that I have to sort of make up at the end of the day when I do that too, when I'm just basing it off of meals I want versus planning ahead. I love planning ahead because then I know I have all these different options and I know what puzzle pieces I can work in. And I know that I'm going to end up being able to have my dessert, my sweet treat at the end of the day if I want it or whatever I actually want versus having to eat a ton of chicken because I have a ton of protein left over. So planning ahead can be key. And especially if you feel like, oh, it's really a chore to log, by planning out a few different days, you can give yourself basically a meal plan that you can follow. And that way you don't actually have to log day to day. You can just follow that plan. If you do like some variety, mapping in a few different meals and knowing what pieces can sort of play together so that they're all easily and quickly saved, even saving meals as different things in there, saving, create a food of different like dishes that you make, making the recipes in there, all those different things allow you to plug and play more easily so that you know it can sort of work. So if you know you have this lunch, you know the different dinner options that really work with it. That gives you variety, but it also makes it really easy to, in a pinch, log at the beginning of the day or log at the end of the day or even log as you're letting something heat up, right? But the key is making Making it so easy that you're not relying on willpower, self-control to necessarily do it. So planning ahead, even knowing that, hey, I'm in a rush right now during this season and I'm eating out a lot more, plan in those restaurant meals. That way you know what you can do to work around them and it makes it really easy to track versus then stressing about how to find it later on. The more you can sort of preload yourself and plan ahead and make it a little bit harder before you even start, the easier it is when you actually have those stressful times come. So think at the beginning of starting out, if you have a little bit more free time, how can I log different things that set me up for success? Because these are all the different options I might want. And then even think about how can I like prep and freeze food to have that easily on hand. Now, if you're thinking, okay, that's great, you know, but I'm great during the week. It's the weekends that sabotage my tracking. Think about why. Think about all the different habit changes that happen with the weekend. And think about how you can maybe map in different meals for the weekend, map in those restaurant meals out. Different ways you can keep yourself consistent, even pre-logging for the weekend where you might log as you go through the day during the week. But how can you address the fact that the weekends are different and you want to stay consistent with tracking them? Even knowing, hey, I'm going to do some days that aren't as you know good in terms of hitting my macros and I'm going to log them anyway. Even if I don't know exactly the foods, I'm going to enter something as close as I can just for that consistency and accountability. Sometimes I even do that with clients on vacation. While I don't necessarily want them judging, it is, you know, a time where I feel like we should be experiencing the events. We shouldn't necessarily be restricting. Finding our balance is key, but sometimes even still logging during that just to stay in the habit because the more you do, the more you do. Even if they're logging, oh, I just ate this restaurant dish out. They're not caring about macros. They're not caring about anything. It keeps them consistent. But think about what will help you actually embrace that consistency with tracking instead of just saying, I want to be consistent with it and then feeling overwhelmed with actually doing it. Think about how you can help yourself overcome the challenges you've seen in the past when trying to get consistent with it. Then 
one of the big things that also comes up is like life throws off my plans, right? All of a sudden someone brings lunch at work or all of a sudden, you know, we're in a pinch and our kids want to eat out. All of a sudden life throws something in our way and we feel like we just can't stay consistent with it. This is where I love having frozen meals. I love having restaurants already logged in. I like to know what I can grab and go from the grocery store, right? Whether it's deli turkey, uh, cocktail shrimp, Greek yogurt, protein bars there. There's so much we can actually get out there, especially if we say, okay, well, let me pause for just a second enter these options out and then figure out what else they can do. Even knowing that sometimes, you know, hey, when life does throw your plans off, what's a minimum you know you can go back to? A calorie cap, a protein minimum. What can you do to at least help yourself move forward? And you know what? Starting out, it might be like, okay, my calories aren't what I want them to be. My protein isn't what I want it to be, but I logged at least, right? Think about the minimum you can do to keep making those 1% improvements and think ahead of time. If life throws off my plans, what can I have pre-planned that would be easy in a pinch? Can I have extra bars? Can I have jerky for when I'm on the go? Can I have those frozen meals either, you know, bought from a service I use Megafit personally, or even like pre-freezing some of the protein that you've cooked in bulk, right? Having frozen vegetables that you can easily reheat. Again, those restaurant meals that you can already pre-log. And as much as we demonize fast food, they have a lot of the nutritional information. And then, you know, you go to places and you can easily get grilled chicken or, you know, easy tacos. So you'd be surprised by what you can work in. Now, if you've ever thought, I want to eat more vegetables, okay, this is a great, well-intended one, but amazingly, it can be difficult. We think, oh, well, I have now too much diversity in my fridge, and I don't eat it all, and all of a sudden, I have all these things I'm throwing out. Frozen vegetables is one of my amazing hacks to do this in that I can get Brussels sprouts, asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, all frozen, and I know it won't go bad, so that I can pull out servings of each and even combine into different vegetable sautés as I really want. But it makes it easier to eat that wide array and eat the rainbow a little bit more because I'm getting frozen instead of even fresh. Where fresh, I feel like I have to have specific things planned. Otherwise, it'll go bad and I don't like wasting food. Okay. And you can easily microwave them when you're in a pinch on the go. They're lower calorie, right? It can be easy to work in a variety of them. Now, if you're thinking like, I just can't remember to do some of the things that I need, I think it's key we recognize that our habits have to be a priority or we won't do them. So if you think about what you prioritize in your day, if that were to have to fall to the evening, right? Some, some chore, something would have to fall to the evening. You're going to do it anyway because it's a priority to you. But if something's not a priority, you need to focus on doing it first because that way you do remember to do it. So when I want to ingrain a new habit, something that I'm going to sort of potentially let fall by the wayside if I don't do it first, I do it first because I know that makes it a priority in my day and then I get in the habit of doing it. So you might set checklists, you might set alarms on your phone, okay? Those are little reminders that I like to have, but I like to make sure that I've planned it in to do it first so that it doesn't just get forgotten, okay? By doing it first, it's done for the day, we've set it up. Again, logging your food first in the day, making sure that you drink some extra water first thing in the morning instead of letting it fall and then getting busy with the day, right? All those things are super helpful. If you're trying to eat more vegetables, put them in that breakfast first thing in the day. That makes it easier, right? But do it first because that allows things that we know we'll do anyway because they're priorities to us to fall later in the day because we will still then do them, okay? And the last tip I wanted to go over was I can't hit my macros. So this is, you know, not not a weird thing because if you were hitting your macro ratios naturally, you wouldn't need to track them, right? But most of us don't know what our macro breakdowns need to be, the portions we need to consume to see the results we want because food is so much more than just fuel in our life and has been often for a very long time. So the first time we're tracking, it's going to take us looking at the portions in a different way. This is why pre-planning a day can be so key because what you can do is you can log out what you usually like to do. And then you can say, okay, I usually eat three ounces of chicken on my salad or three ounces of tofu. If I make this four, how will that impact it? Or instead of doing chicken thigh, can I do chicken breast, lower the fat? Okay, that will impact it this way. Or even tofu versus satan or, or tempeh, like all these different things, right? We can do different types of protein to see how it then impacts everything. But planning ahead can really help us understand the breakdown of the foods we're already consuming and then what we can do to adjust. Because you might say, oh, my fat's really high and then go through each food and be like, what, what has more fat? Okay, well, how could I reduce the fat in this, right? And then you can even Google, you know, what are lower fat foods? But we want to think, how can I create swaps? How can I make it easier to hit my macros? Can I log meals ahead of time? Can I buy pre-frozen meals? Can I even look for different recipes that have macros already to make it easier to log those in? But you need to realize that you, if you were hitting these naturally, you wouldn't have to log. So something's going to have to change. So the more we can give ourselves that data to step back, the more we can then see how we best adjust for ourselves to create something sustainable. 
Just remember, it's not enough to know what you want to accomplish. You need to give yourself how you're going to do it. And the smaller you make these changes, the easier they're going to be to build upon. Something is better than nothing. Yet so often, if we can't do our ideal workout, we think, well, I'm just not going to do anything. But even five minutes, guys, is enough to keep you moving forward. A, it keeps us in the routine. It makes us feel successful because we did something on days where otherwise we wouldn't have done anything, right? But something is better than nothing because it keeps us moving. We can do that mobility work. We can actually get in an intense workout in just five minutes, which I'm going to show you how. But we have to remember that it's sometimes not even about what we actually did. It's about the mindset we create from it. And so by doing five minutes when you otherwise would have done nothing, it does keep you in the pattern. And the more you do, the more you do. But it does have us have that mentality of success because we achieve something during a hard period. It proved our strength to ourselves by continuing to move forward and doing something when it would be so easy to do nothing. And that's why I wanted to share this little quick five minute routine. So I love when I'm very short on time to just say it's five minutes and set a timer for that time. You know, I will try and do, you know, at least the world's greatest stress, some sort of a little warm up, a little foam rolling up a couple, couple areas. But then even just saying, here's my five minutes. I'm doing this workout. It makes it a lot easier than if you're like, well, here are the exercises and I'm going to do reps and sets and you don't know how long exactly it will take. Usually you can have a feel, but you still don't know. By just setting that timer, it consolidates it just to that time. So five minutes. I call it the five minute fight round. Okay. I'm going to take you through burpee sit throughs, jack push ups, down, down, up, and plank climbers. So these moves, and you do five to 10 reps of the burpee sit throughs, five to 10 reps of the jack push ups, three to five per side of the down, down, up, and then three to five per side of the plank climbers. You do that for five minutes, you're going to feel like you got in a good workout, a good sweat. Okay. So the burpee sit through, you're going to jump overhead, you're going to come down, you're going to sit through and sit through. Okay. You're going to kick through to each side. If you need to modify, you don't have to jump. You can also do it off the bench where you just sort of hop back, kick through, kick through, okay? And then you can do a little jump at the top, okay? But you can use that bench to limit the range of motion. Again, you can also just step here, okay? And do the sit-throughs, okay? And then step in, in, and up. But you want to do the burpee sit-through five to ten. Jack push-ups, you're going to do your push-up, okay? After your push-up, you're going to jump your feet out and back in, okay? You can also step out, out, in, in. Okay. And then you can always go down to your knees for the push up. Although I always prefer the incline where you can either step or jump your feet out and in and then do the push up off the incline. Okay. Next will be down, down, ups. So here you're going to sink down into this little squat. You're going to go down, down, up, up. You're going to hop. Okay. And then you're going to sink back down. And then you're going to go down, down, up, up, hop. Okay. So you can take out the hop. You can also just start with a tap, tap. And then up on the toes, okay? So you can take out the, the impact. But you want to do three to five percent of that. Then plank climbers. With the plank climbers, you're starting your forearms, okay? You're going to climb up, up, down, down. And then you can switch sides. You can do this off your knees. Or an incline is great for this as well. You can climb up, up, down, down, okay? Make sure you keep your back engaged to support your shoulders. So often we let our hands get out in front and we let our shoulders elevate. We want to make sure that we engage the sides of our back, protect those shoulders, okay? Just four moves, five minutes. Keep running through that with the most advanced variation you can, modifying if you need to keep moving. It's a great way to make something really work for you. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Fitness Hacks podcast. Hopefully these tips are really helpful. I know it can feel like a struggle sometimes to make those new habit changes. And even once we feel like we finally have a new habit ingrained, life can throw something our way that seems to sabotage us. Because we have to remember too that those old patterns are always there and we will want to sort of default back into them. So being conscious of them and always looking to make those 1% improvements and meet ourselves where we're at while optimizing for the struggles and past challenges is so key. Mm -hmm.